All right, this is a good program. I've listened to part of it, not all of it. But I wanted to share it with my viewing, my viewers, pertaining to what's being said here today on Face the Nation with Miss Margaret. Miss Margaret usually always talks about some real good topics, about things that's going to be affecting not just the nation, but the world in general. And uh, I kind of like the way that she brings things out as being a, you know, a good commentator in the aspect of uh, how she approaches different subject matters without actually offending the people that she's interviewing. So I kind of feel like that she, you know, she, as far as I'm concerned, she's top rank, especially when it comes to the, to the high amatis that thinks that they should know stuff that we shouldn't know about. But I just want to say one thing before I start this to my Native American brothers and sisters, especially to the Cherokee tribe. I understand and have always understood, and this is one of our downfalls, I personally believe, that has caused us not to be near as predominant as what we should have been is that we want to sit idly by and become silent over too many gravitated, gravitationable matters that can not only affect our lives, but all lives. And I put it under the cliche of, of uh, they, they claim that there's, there's a, uh, they claim that there's a, a good Indian and a bad Indian, and the difference between the good Indian and the bad Indian is that if you have two that fall off of a cliff before one or the other hits the ground, the bad Indian will scream knowing that he's fixing to fall to his death, and the good Indian will become silent and never utter a word on the way down to his death. The reason for this is because the good Indian remain quiet. <clears throat> that way, the enemy that's approaching him would not be able to identify where the rest of the other tribe is. The bad Indian was that one that screamed out right before he hit the ground. That now made an utterly sound to the degree that now the rest of the tribe can be identified towards where they are. I understand the analogy of that. I understand the strategy in behind that, especially whenever you have an enemy that that, that is that close. <clears throat> Under the circumstances, the way that my brother and I was being attacked and hunted right here in Northwest Tennessee, I really didn't feel like that I had no other choice other than to scream out to let other people know what type of violations that we was receiving here at this area as well as other areas that I've been poked at and, and uh, progged and, and punched at and slapped and, and abused and used and hunted and, and taunted and, and all the above. I feel like because of the surrounding circumstances, it has forced me into being more, more uh, vocal in these matters. And hopefully... The information that I share with the viewing audience that I have will be to enlighten or help society rather than hurt society. That's what my whole primary goals has been all along since God the Father um, given me a revelation that I was given not only in 1983 but in 1988 pertaining to the Antichrist the one world government, the, the new world order, uh, the two witnesses, and the opening of the seals pertaining to biblical Bible prophecies. That's been my whole concept is towards wanting to help my people and not hurt my people. But whenever you have a group of people that you're having to basically go, go to war against because they're going to war with you because society has become so upside down, society has become so evil over here in the western world, 
uh, you really don't have no other choice other than to speak out and say the things that needs to be said. By and large, if things would have went appropriately, which obviously they didn't, beginning in the late 80s with the Ronald Reagan administration, all I would have had to have done was properly prepare my people in what was ahead in regards towards the opening of the seals pertaining to the end time global events that now we're facing. But because circumstances arose, because various people wanted to destroy the message coming from the messenger, and the only way that they know to destroy the message was to destroy the messenger. They'd done the exact same thing with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ had not done nothing deemed necessary of destroying that individual. The only reason why that they destroyed him is, be is because they wanted to destroy his message. A matter of fact, Jesus Christ had a hit. He had a, a uh, warrant for his death before he had ever even been born good. He was, I think, king of one of the kings over there that ordered for every male child to be beheaded because they were so infuriated by the message, not the messenger. They was infuriated by the message because at that time the messenger was just a little bitty baby, an infant, that this king had heard about this great king fixing to come into play. And what they didn't understand is that it wasn't a biological, physical king, but it was a spiritual king. And that's where society crisscrossed and got it wrong. Just like society over here in the Western world that wanted to attack me because of me standing up for a righteous, holy, eternal God through the Lord Jesus Christ because of their lifestyles being either so so uh, perverted or their lifestyles being so frightened of, of the inevitable towards what's going to happen to all of us whenever we all die. They attacked me. They wanted to put an end to me. Away with him, away with him, away with him is what Jesus' own people was saying in the day of court. In other words, we want this man dead. We want him gone. We weren't going to have anything that he was talking about because we didn't agree with it. We didn't like his message, and because we don't like his message, we don't like him. Well, you know what? I'm sorry about the message that God has given to me to give to others. And if you don't like that message, then my suggestion would be to take it up with God. Because he was the one that gave me the message to begin with. This isn't about me. This is about us. But most importantly, it's about God. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's also about the calamity that began up in heaven whenever Lucifer decided to challenge the kingdom of God. It's about the truth. And most people don't like the truth. A matter of fact, most people wouldn't identify the truth if they was to stumble over it. Because they live in a fantasy world. They live in a world of a bubble that, that, that they've created around their, their own lifestyles. And, and they, you know, you, you can tell a lie to the point that you actually start believing in your own lies. And it's sad, but that's, that's what's happened to America. And that's what's happened to the world pertaining to all this barbarianism that's going on. Now we're going to get into something re real quick right here, pertaining to the Ukrainians. This is one of the Ukrainian representatives there sitting with uh, Margaret. And she's going to tell you some things that obviously a lot of people don't want to hear. But what she's going to tell you is the truth about what has went on, what is going on. Please listen. Welcome back to Facebook.
face the nation. We turn now to the Ukrainian ambassador to the U.S., Oksana Markarova. Great to have you back with us. Good morning. Uh, your president and our president said that Ukraine's running out of ammunition. So how quickly will this latest U.S. package arrive and how quickly will it make a difference? Well, first of all, let me say how grateful we are to President Biden and to everyone for making this decision to provide us with this munition. I know everyone is discussing how difficult it was and sometimes even call it controversial, but there is nothing controversial about it. We're fighting on our territory, brutal enemy. There is nothing worse than uh, tortures, rapes, and everything that Russians do on the territories they occupy, and we need to liberate as quick as possible. So we're really grateful that in times when we do need increased numbers of munitions to support our counteroffensive, that U.S. made the decision, and we really hope we will see it very quickly on the battlefield. So to support their cause. That's what she's talking about, their cause. And their cause, according to President Biden, should be our cause. Because their cause is a cause towards freedom and democracy pertaining to having their own decisions and making their own rational um decisions and what they do with their lives without somebody being a dictator uh, or, or a communist control uh, control freak like like they are over there in Russia that wants to control everybody else's life and telling them every little move that they make and after you get through at the end of the day instead of the money belonging to you it belongs to one of the oligarchs it's a cause and it's a cause that all Democrat nations should I believe embrace and support. Now, rather than if they do or not, that's going to be another thing. But, you know, I'm not a dictator myself. I'm just saying that it is a worthy cause. So these cluster munitions drop bomblets. Um, and sometimes those bomblets don't explode right away. And years later, they can be a danger. I've met victims who've been blinded and maimed in places where the U.S. dropped these decades ago. So when the White House says that Ukraine has made assurances on how it will use these, how do you do this and assure that civilians won't be hurt? Well, first of all, let's remind where we start with. Ukraine is the most mined country now <clears throat> already. Russians mined uh, everywhere. The unexploded ordinance is everywhere. So we're doing a lot of demining. And U.S., by the way, is helping us a lot in demining already now. With regard to these munitions that we will be getting from the U.S., uh, first, they are of a much higher quality So to start with. And second, as responsible as we are with all other American supplied or European supplied munitions. We are controlling it. We we have a very uh, responsible ways. We use the NATO type of log fast system to record every unit that we have, where it is. Mm -hmm. We will use the same type of approach to this. We will know where we use it, how we used it. And of course, you know, every time we liberate our territories, these uh, D-miners are the first people that go there try to make sure that the, the area is safe. So we will do exactly the same. And I imagine Russia uses these on civilian areas. I have to imagine Ukraine has pledged not to do that and only to use them on soldiers. Oh my God, they use uh, this and phosphor and everything else specifically on civilian areas <clears throat> and destroying civilian areas. And that's we important. definitely that's we will not do, we will not use it in civilian populated areas. Um, that's a war crime aspect that, that Russia has been criticized for on this. Um, when you heard President Biden say Ukraine's not ready for NATO membership, what did you think? Uh, we are getting ready for NATO membership. Uh, we know and we're doing very difficult reforms even as we fight for it. What we're definitely ready for is for invitation. And I think, you know, with regard to uh, the NATO membership, if you look at uh, any, any uh, aspect of it, Ukraine is very ready in a number of aspects. And if there is something that is left there, we can sure do it uh, later on. But we are discussing now about the invitation. You know, you know that in 2008, the uh, open door policy towards Ukraine have been adopted. Uh, we want not only the door to be open, we want to be invited to come in. Well, the White House seemed to close the door on that part of the invitation, at least, but eventually allow for Ukraine to join NATO. That was that seemed to be the signal White House was sending on Friday. Well, the discussions are still ongoing, and the discussion, and of course, it's the discussion that requires 31 countries to agree. 
Uh, and again, as uh, you, you know, with like with the European Union uh, uh, membership, there is a path towards the European Union. We are candidate country, and we are working towards our full membership. Similar approach uh, we take with NATO. We want to be in NATO. The majority of Ukrainians support Ukraine in NATO. Uh, this is in our constitution. And we have done the majority of reforms already to be NATO eligible. We are ready to continue on that path. And we would like to see that our friends in NATO uh, are together with us on this path. Uh, and I want to weigh, I want to weigh in on what they're saying right here, pertaining to that, because she's not e e elaborating on it quite, quite well. The reason why the American people are hesitant towards breaking into that type of uh, agreement with NATO and the United Nations, etc., is because they they have looked through this in the degree of saying that it could actually look provoking to the Russian government, to the degree that they would actually bring out the big stuff rather than just use the little stuff. Right now they're still using per se the little stuff even though it's been Russia that's been using the cluster bombs and other types of bombs and it's been Russia that's been violating all the Geneva agreements pertaining to bombing innocent civilians over there. The American people are trying to stay out of this as much as they can and if they was to automatically put them into the acceptances of NATO, the United Nations, that would automatically put not only NATO but put us under the crosshairs of now we're the ones that engage this and provoke this and now we're going to be the ones that's going to be responsible for this. The thing about it is Russia was the ones that went at this in the wrong direction to begin with because Russia thought that they was going to be able to achieve their objectives in less than a week from the time that they invaded over there. They had no idea that these people was going to stand up so strongly and be willing to die for their cause. They're not the Afghanistan people. We're dealing with the two different sectors of people here. We're dealing with a group of people that are willing to fight for their cause even unto death. That's the difference. And because it could look provocative. We're being hesitant towards a line for them to join up with the United Nations. I wanted to elaborate on that. The largest nuclear plant in Europe, once again, was very much in focus on the front line of this conflict. Um, your president says Ukraine has intelligence showing that Russia will try to blow it up, that it has mined the area. The UN watchdog says they've only been able to search parts of the area. So far it looks okay, but there are two key reactors they want access to. What is the level of risk right now? The level of risk there is consistently high since March 4th, 2022, since Russians illegally occupied Ukrainian nuclear station. Mm -hmm. So we just have to be very clear from the start, every time we discuss the Parisian nuclear plant, the largest nuclear plant in, Euro in Europe, that the only source of risk there is Russia. Uh, you add to that Russia's absolutely irresponsible withdrawal or uh, suspension of the New START treaty, their decision to deploy uh, the tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus, and it's clear that we are dealing with a nuclear terrorist. Now, look at Chernobyl station, which they also grabbed since they invaded us in February 22. As soon as Russians are out of there, there is no risk. Similar here, we all have to work together to get them out. Because again, let me remind you about the Kohovka Dam destruction, which Russians did, knowing how devastating it will be. So the, the intent, and there is no uh, red lines for them there. We just have to stay focused and get them out from the station. And then what, now what she's talking about pertaining to the Jehovah Dam is absolutely 100% correct. It was the Russians that done that. And they'd done that under the pretense of knowing what type of damage that it was going to cause across the field, across the, the whole region. And it has. It has affected people's lives. I think uh, immediately it was like half a million people that got affected uh, whenever the dam initially went off, not counting all the crops and the, and the people that are not going to be able to put in the crops. It, it's a adding factor to bringing that much more horror into these people's lives. It's an adding factor in recognizing that 
the Russian government does not care in any ethnic rules pertaining to the Geneva uh, agreements that was made after World War II, that they don't care. You know why they don't care? Because they're basically holding the world hostage with their nuclear armament. We never should have allowed for them to have been able to have done that. We shouldn't have allowed for any nation to become predominant with all that type of nuclear armament. It's one thing for a nation to become nuclear because of creating energy for their people. And it's another thing to create nuclear with the intentions towards harm and hurt. And that's what we have set idly by for the past 35, 40 years. Ever since the Cold War ended, we have set idly by and we have watched them make one nuclear facility after another that now is putting the world in jeopardy, basically holding the world hostage that we're going to do what we want to do, according to the Russians' government. And if y'all try to intervene, well, we'll just use this armament on, on you. It's a very, very evil strategy. And because of it, the Americans, as well as other people throughout the world, are having to walk on a tight line because of these things. A very, very tight, tight line. Because of what the Russian government is in, embarked up into. I've had, it, I've had myself questioned by, by people around here locally pertaining to um, everybody going battery, pertaining to battery cars, um, going towards alternative energies that that there's no way that um, that the TVA the local T, uh, TVA uh, station around here is going to be able to maintain that type of power if it, because you're going to have to have power grids everywhere we know this trust me we know this as engineers and we also know that we will have to depend upon nuclear energy in the future if we go all battery if we're going to have these charging stations all over America. It's already been penciled in towards what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. So people questioning whether or not it's the proper right thing to do or not, they need to get on board towards the big plan and get away from the little plan. What's more, the big wheels up there that makes these decisions for us all, they're the ones that are now putting various things into play and that's the uh, that I'm just explaining to you the primary reason why that they haven't already done given the Ukrainians the green light of joining up with the with the uh, with the United Nations is because it could give out the wrong signal of it being provocative. Now there may come a time, the way the Russians are going at this, the Russian government is going at this, there may come a time to where it don't matter any longer in what type of uh, imagery. That, that the world is going to be looking at pertaining to the Ukrainian people joining up with the, with the Europeans and the United Nations over there. But we'll make that decision whenever it's time to make that decision, providing that Russia is willing to push it to the letterhead of the degree that it really don't matter at that point in time. Then we'll have to abide by certain rules and regulations, war rules, as far as doing things in certain ways. And I'm pretty sure that our people that's watching this, they don't have no problem at all in making that right decision whenever that decision needs to be made. Because this is all a bunch of BS that is coming out of the Kremlin that could have been resolved in a much more better, upstanding, professional, honorable, noble way. The way that they're doing this is not noble. This is evil. This is full evil in, in the full form. Ukrainian hands fully again, there will be no risks. Does Ukraine support what the UN's calling for, which is, you know, sort of a safe zone around it so that Ukraine isn't shelling in the area and neither is Russia? Look, all Ukraine should be demilitarized from Russian military. So we have to get them out from everywhere in Ukraine, uh, not to allow them uh, create some safe zones for them inside Ukraine. We are very responsible, as you have seen during all this period, towards the nuclear Zaporizhia nuclear station. But the only answer to uh, that problem is no Russians there. It's Ukrainian territory, it's Ukrainian station, and it, there should not be occupiers, brutal occupiers there. 
We will be watching. She's only stating a fact. Watching what happens this week at NATO. And so good to have you back with us, Ambassador. We'll be right back. Thank you. <laughs> towards the end of the interview, she was only, only saying the fact pertaining to who should be in control of that particular nuclear uh, facility over there. Cox, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. It's good to talk face to face. I know you're on this coast because of the National Governors Association and meetings there. And the group's putting some special focus on mental health, but broadly protecting kids. When it comes to children, the firearms are the leading cause of death among kids. The Salt Lake City Tribune pointed out that at the state level, there's been an impulse to, da to ban dangerous things for kids on many levels. You've talked about social media. Uh, you've focused on transgender issues. But that doesn't extend to firearms, even at the state level. Why is that? When you look at the gun numbers in the state of Utah, mm -hmm. the, those numbers increasing are not being driven by people getting caught in the crossfire or you know kids shooting each other. It's being driven specifically by mental health and suicide issues. Now we're doing more to, to help keep guns away from kids, keep them locked up. But but what is it that's that's driving that desire to say life is not worth living anymore? And and how do we as a society collectively uh, work to make sure the kids know that it is going to get better and, and uh, there. There, there is a reason to stay here. That's a huge focus for us as well. Your state is the first, as I understand it, to restrict social media access by minors, although that law doesn't go into effect until March of next year. Correct. Um, you just had this judge this week um, make a, a determination that the Biden administration uh, should be prohibited from discussing with social media companies. Anything that encourages, pressures, or induces in any manner the removal, deletion, suppression, or reduction of content. Is that ruling going to affect what you are trying to do at the state level to protect young kids from harmful content? I don't think so. I, I don't assume that that's that's more of a content restriction. I'm sure we'll have social media companies suing the state of Utah. In fact, we're going to be suing social media companies for for the harm and damage that they're they're causing our young people. I, I suspect that at some point the Supreme Court will weigh in on this decision when it comes to restricting youth access. There's not just a correlation between social media use and an increase in in suicide, anxiety, depression, self-harm. Um, th there is a causal link there. First of all, you got you to keep things into perspective and what that we have recently just got through going through pertaining to COVID. COVID has upset the apple cart in normalcy in our government as well as other governments throughout the world. That's first of all, looking at it from, from a... Uh, psychiatrically or psychiatric uh, psychiatrically uh, uh, standpoint or aspect. Second thing is pertaining to morale. It was talking about suicides. They don't know what's causing the up, uptake with the suicides. Whenever you have a society that's raised their children up the way that we have towards them basically being given everything in the world, spoiling them to death, and now all of a sudden, a lot of those privileges has been taken away. That in and of itself is going to be a deterrent that's going to cause people to basically say to themselves, well, I'd rather be dead than I would be alive. But whenever you have politicians over here in America that has made such great failure decisions to the point that now our society looks at, looks at the American government towards it being nothing but a failure because of not only what that we have done in the past, but what we're also doing presently in, in the future towards being able to build the future. Whenever you do this on a, on a morale level, you have damaged the morale to the degree that uh, now a lot of people are looking at this in the aspect that death would actually be more inviting than life because they have lost interest in America no longer being the leading dominant um, futuristic solutions to all the problems and because we don't have good politicians with good ideals to help us get out of this problem that we're in obviously these younger kids and well probably middle age too as well I mean they're looking at this from the aspect 
you know what? We would probably be better off dead than we would be alive. And at one time, America had just the very opposite effect upon to their morale, especially after World War II, during the smokestack industry days, back during the baby boomer days, whenever the toasters and the microwaves and the TVs was being introduced to society and everything uh, was going in a predominant successful rate, we had everything in the world to look forward to and nothing to lose. Well, now it has changed. What has changed this? The works of the Luciferian Lucifer has changed this because he has deceived the world. And now we have went down this endless path that we never should have went down. And because of it, we're crying a crawfish and our politicians don't know just exactly how or in what method that we are towards getting us out of these problems that we're in. This is going back to what went on in the late 80s that America took a left turn whenever they should have took a right. And a lot of that responsibility and accountability falls upon the shoulders of the church more so than the shoulders of the politicians. Because it wasn't that I was not doing what I was supposed to be doing down here in the field because I was. But I never could get no supporters. I never could get nobody to back me. I never could get nobody that would put any faith in me. And those that did snarled up their nose at it because everybody wants to go to heaven but don't nobody want to die to get there because they've obviously been blinded or deceived to the degree of thinking that they're not going to be going to have to die to get to heaven i didn't do this the works of the devil done this the deception done this and that's what has put a clinker in so many suicides thanks there there are 18 different states that have now enacted laws that restrict in some way access to gender transition care for kids. In Utah, you have said that you are just pausing access to that kind of care. You're not banning it. Do you have an end date to that pause? What specifically is the kind of data and research you need to see to say you will allow for it. Yes, yeah, so we, do, we don't have an end date, um, but uh, we, we we do need more data and more information. This is such a charged topic it is. that it's been uh, it's been impossible, I believe, to get good information um, here in the United States right now because half the country doesn't want to touch it and, and the other half is convinced that they already know the answer. And so I, I've really tried to look elsewhere um, at, at conversations that are happening in other countries, um, specifically in Europe, around, around this where it's not not quite as charged, um, looking at, at, at Sweden and Finland and, and France and, and the UK, uh, other countries where they don't have the same culture war battles that we're having here. And they're also pushing pause. I, I mean, many of those countries are saying, look, we're, uh, this is- specific part of it? Is on it both. hormone treatment, puberty blockers, surgery? Both, all of, all of, all of the above, yeah. Because the yeah. American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, and the American Academy of Pediatrics have said this kind of care, um, that they, they've rejected the claims that it is yeah. harmful. Yeah, all but very political groups. And, and again, I, I, I don't. I, I believe that they are politicized. Those groups are politicized. The I don't American believe. Academy of Pediatrics. I absolutely okay. do. Yes, yes. On, on this issue, it, it, it's impossible to get unbiased information out of the United States right now on this issue. I, I just don't believe it. So, just on the numbers of 73 million children in the U.S., there were just 56 genital surgeries related to dysphoria between 2019 and 2021, according to the study by Komodo Health and Reuters. Yeah, do you have the numbers on uh, on on hormone therapy and 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 in those puberty years? blockers? What, in what the is the number? It, it, they're you. exploding. We we went from like ten. 10 years ago to several hundred this past year. Mm -hmm. I mean, th those numbers, and, and again, in this Utah? is in Utah happening? alone. Yeah. You don't know what's driving Well, that's, that's what these scientists in other countries are actually trying to figure yeah. out where in, in the United States, we're putting our head in the sand and saying, we're not even going to talk about this or look about this. You can't even have a discussion about it. Right. In other countries, they're saying something is happening. Hundreds in my state, thousands all across the country um, that are making requests for this. Yeah. And they have, they're, they're presenting with several several other mental health issues as well. In the numbers we saw, the trend is definitely up, but um, they're still pretty 
small in terms of surgeries and mastectomies. But, but only, a, a only in terms of surgeries. Data. Yeah, the, the other data, and, and you can look anywhere, yeah. uh, this is not unique. Um, it, it, yes, there the are a lot of surgeries sure. happening, but the trend, it's not just up, it's up exponentially. It's, it's, it's a hockey stick increase. It, it, it's still a, a small percentage though. Um, but, but I hear your point on wanting more data. Can I ask you specifically about a bill um, that is now law. They, it, it, you had an interesting stance on this. You rejected the bill initially. Your legislature overrode your veto. It's now law. Um, and it would bar transgender students from participating in uh, girls sports. According to the reporting at the time, there were just four transgender players in the entire state out of 85,000 student athletes. At the time you argued for empathy when you vetoed this, you said there are these are just four kids trying to get through the day. Rarely has so much fear and anger been directed at so few. Why didn't that call for empathy persuade your party? Why did they need to write something to affect four kids? This is another one of the mistakes that has been made with America in allowing for the small fox to come into the vineyard. I've used this theory before that it's not the big fox that you wor got to worry about coming into the vineyard and spoiling the vineyard. It's the little fox. It's the little things in life that if we don't watch, if we compromise on, on our stand or on our Christian stand pertaining to these things, the next thing you know, a little bit of bad turns into a whole lot of bad. It's kind of like one bad apple spoils the whole bushel basket of apples. You know, you can take a bad apple, one bad apple, and put it in a in a in a bushel basket with all the good apples, and that one bad apple will create an environment to the point that the rest of the apples go bad too. But at the same time, you can take a bunch of bad apples and put it in a bushel basket with a bunch of, uh, take, take one good apple and put it in a basket with a bunch of bad apples in it. The whole ba basket is all rotten apples. And that one apple cannot perform the performances towards reversing the entity like the bad apple can. So what does that say? That tells me that darkness can have an influence or bad or ugly or something rotten can have a profound effect upon a people's lives, and that's what has occurred here. They compromised with the four, and now they're having an assertion of all these others that's just going rapidly off, off the scale. Please listen. In my veto letter, I, I said I actually agree with what you're trying to accomplish here. I, I think it is wrong to have a you know a, a, a transgender female, um, a person who was who was born a male, uh, taking scholarships to, records uh, away from people. The the, the 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 pen swimmer is the the example of that, right? Okay. The example that everybody uses, and I, and so that that was my point. I, I that should not happen. What we were negotiating in the state of Utah was something that would allow some kids to play and others not to, depending on their their physical capability. I do believe that there is a, a lack of compassion and empathy in our politics today. Mm -hmm. um, we are we have a toxic division. The culture wars are happening. Um, there are culture warriors on all sides that are you know trying to change, trying to get their way, trying to cancel others or or prevent others from from being able to to do what what they want to do. And and, and 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 it's definitely a problem. I'm I'm, I'm hoping that you can be an example of, of being a little better on that side. There are at least six current or former governors, yeah. Republican governors running for president right now. Can any of them defeat Donald Trump in a primary? Well, I, I will, need your party. I hope so. I like governors. Um, I think governors are great. I think mm -hmm. governors have real experience. Um, the, the great thing about governors is we actually have to get stuff done, mm -hmm. right? We, we can't just do the performance thing. Um, you have to, you know, potholes aren't, aren't partisan. Right. Um, you, you have to, you have to do those kind of things. And I think we have lots of amazing choices and, um, I'm, I'm really hopeful that we can, we can turn the page, um, and, uh, and, and, and try something else. Someone who can win, which I think is important, and uh, I think any of our, any of those governors uh, could could win, and and I certainly hope we'll give them a chance. Governor, thank you. I'm glad to have you here in person, and uh, hope to have you back. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you. We'll be back with a lot more Face the Nation. Stay with us.
See, I can remember as a teenager around in this area, and this is going all the way back to the 70s, that transgender, gays, lesbians was not a predominant thing at that time, but it was becoming more obvious that it was in society. A matter of fact, there was somebody, I think they had a TV program about burning the bed or some, some, some dude was abusing his wife and she tied him up in the bed and, and, and burnt the bed uh, that night that they had several different incidences that was similar to that. There was also an incident around in this area about somebody being bobbed. Um, somebody got bobbed uh, pertaining to activity that was considered very, very abnormal whenever I was a child growing up. Today, that type of talk has has become the norm. A matter of fact, on my mother's side, on the Jordan side, um, my mother's brother, Charles Jordan, his oldest daughter, Donna, that was older than Joanne, she went through the same problem pertaining to her husband being a cross-dresser. And this was in the early 70s, the late 60s. That was considered very, very abnormal at that time for somebody to be a, basically a drag queen. But the ugliness, the small fox, was doing its damage at that time. And we didn't realize what type of damage that the small fox was actually doing until now. Now we can identify that the smaller fox had got into the vineyard that chewed a little on this vine, chewed a little on that vine, kept chewing, kept chewing, kept chewing, to the point that now the vineyard is starting to die. And the master of the house goes around and starts looking at, at different signs. Well, my God, he, he was over here, he was over here, he was over here. Well, that's what's causing the vineyard to die. It was the smaller things, the compromising things that we never should have tolerated with that has now put us ridiculously where we are today as an American supposed to have been a righteous, godly nation. A righteous, godly nation. And the only reason why that we want to look at the past is prevent from making the same mistakes in the future. Now what we're fixing to talk about here is the weather, and I only listened to part of this because I realized that I wanted to record this particular message coming from Miss Margaret today. This week is expected to be even hotter. We now want to welcome to the program Kate Calvin, NASA's chief scientist and senior climate advisor. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm excited to be able to ask you some of these questions that I think a lot of people are wondering this week in particular. Um, why is the weather so extreme? Can you explain that for non-scientists? Yeah, so climate change is driving increases in temperature overall. We also have natural cycles that affect temperature, and so the one you're hearing the most about in the news is El Nino or La Nina. So El Nino years tend to be warmer than La Nina. Uh, 2022 was a La Nina year. It was actually the, the warmest La Nina year we've ever had, and it was tied for fifth warmest overall. We're now moving into El Nino. So the combination of climate change and El Nino means we're seeing higher global temperatures, and that brings with it impacts all around the world to people ecosystems, extreme events, and other um, changes that are that were, that were impacting communities. So uh, ocean temperatures are rising, as I understand it, and that factors into this. Can you explain how? So oceans absorb a lot of heat, and so we are seeing um, increases in ocean temperature. Um, when we identify El Nino, it's based on ocean temperatures in a particular part of the Pacific. But the thing to keep in mind is, you know, oceans are actually, land is warming faster than oceans. So the places where we live are warming faster than the ocean. The ground is warming faster than the ocean. Why is the ground warming faster than the ocean? It's because the ground is not merging onto ice to where the water is merging onto the poles pertaining to the ice in the North Pole, ice in the South Pole. Now, eventually, once the ice becomes so diminished that it no longer has that type of energy, 
to resist against the warm water, eventually we will see an increase that will happen to the oceans like we've never seen before. And eventually, instead of the ocean level rising, the ocean level will actually diminish and start going down because of the evaporation that's happening with the planet Earth because the planet Earth is warming up from the inside out. It's the continents right now that are feeling that effect more so than the oceans. You figure there's two-thirds water on the planet versus a third of the continents that's on the planet. Actually, I think it's a little more water than, than uh, two-thirds. But there's more water on the planet than there are land masses. And because of it, the water is going to be affected later than the continents are pertaining to the land masses. We're seeing temperatures now that are spiking, that are going to continue to spike because of the oil that has been stolen from the ground, affecting the ecosystem below our feet that most scientists have never really concentrated on. They really haven't. They've been concentrating more so on what was going on above our heads, more so than what was going on below our feet. And now, and only up until now, we're starting to discover that there's more to environmental global warming other than just the sun and the ozone layer being diminished. We understand that the, that the ozone layer is being diminished because of the gases that we're pumping up into the ap upper atmosphere. The upper atmosphere is becoming hotter. Because the upper, upper atmosphere is becoming hotter, it's becoming more unstable. The moisture level is going higher. It's holding more moisture. And then whenever it does release the moisture, it's coming down in the form of a deluge. Uh, China, southern China, just got through getting hit in, uh, within about 10 days ago of that same deluge that I'm talking about. But listen to what she's talking about here because she's hitting some very good marks in what she's trying to explain. Please listen. We're also seeing increases in temperature over land. So NASA has been doing these reports where you're, you're crunching some of the data to understand how to plan going forward. Um, I was looking at one of them. It says there's going to be severe turbulence with airlines over large regions of the northern hemisphere. Are we already seeing that and why would that happen? So we are experiencing impacts of climate change everywhere around the world right now. There's different impacts in different regions. I think what's important to keep in mind is that climate change is more than just temperature. It's also affecting things like the water cycle. So we're seeing more heavy precipitation events, more droughts. We're seeing increases in extreme events like storms. And we can see those and those impact uh, how we travel, uh, human health, agriculture, and all aspects of our lives. With the planes, it, how certain are you that this will happen or is it already happening? So there's studies that indicate that you can see increases in turbulence linked to climate change. Um, and NASA, some of what we do around aircraft, we have a large aeronautics research team, but we're looking, we look a lot at how um, transportation affects climate. So not just climate affecting transportation, but also how it affects it. And so we do a lot of research into making planes more efficient so they use less energy and generate less emissions and contribute less to warming in the future. The world right now is going through a transformation. It's going through changes. And the reason why the changes is because of what the human, human uh, homo sapiens upon the planet are doing to the planet. Because of the transformation that's going on, you're going to have more areas above our head that are going to be more unstable than they are stable. It's causing irregularities to happen. Because of this, aviation is going to suffer tremendously to the point that it's going to become more dangerous for anybody to be in the air, especially with a heavy load of people, three or four, five hundred people in an airplane. It's going to be extremely dangerous. That's even going to become even more dangerous or in the future towards flying. There are also transportation issues along the Mississippi River mentioned in the report. Uh, cargo shipments have been impacted by river levels. So how do industries who have to plan ahead and businesses that have to plan ahead take this into account? How prepared are we 
So one of the things that we work on is trying to make sure people have access to the information that can support planning. So for river flow, we actually launched a satellite in December um, called SWAT that's going to give us the first global survey of water running through rivers and lakes. So we want to see how much water is running through those rivers and how that changes over time. And that kind of information can be used to better plan in the future. And so NASA would share that? All of our data is publicly available, and one of the things we're working on now is making it easier to use so that you don't have to process raw satellite data, but instead we give you an indicator that you can interpret and use in your planning. Um, so as an example, we have a tool that's uh, designed for farmers that helps them understand how much water their fields are losing so they can better plan their irrigation. Um, NASA also put out a report in May that says climate change is contributing to rise in Lyme disease possibly, um, more mosquito-borne illnesses as well. Seasonal allergies are getting worse. I know plenty of people who are complaining about their allergies these past few weeks. My eyes were watering. Um, how concerned do people need to be? So there are a lot of effects of climate change on health. Um, so uh, in terms of mosquitoes and other uh, uh, diseases that are carried by um, insects, what, the climate, what climate change can do is change where the, the geographic extent of those species. So, you know, mosquitoes need hot conditions, they need water to breed. And so what climate change can, it can do is change that extent so that we see um, in places where you have malaria, it could shift more uh, northern latitudes or higher altitudes. But there's other effects of climate change. You mentioned pollen. One of the things that we saw here in the northeast of the U.S. recently was about wildfire smoke. Mm -hmm. So there were wildfires burning in Canada and the smoke from that came into the U.S. and led to air quality concerns all across the northeastern U.S. And we'll see more of that with climate change. More of these fires. Uh, we'll yeah. see more. So what climate change brings is more fire weather. Um, so conditions where it's hot, dry, and windy. More fuel for fires. So more dry vegetation that can burn um, and can also lengthen the fire season. So we're seeing all of those changes. What we're trying to do, though, is make sure people can be prepared for it. And so see, right. we can see where fires are burning now. We can see burn scars and burn perimeters. We can look at how emissions from fire move around the world. Well, and that's what's interesting is that this isn't just admiring the problem you're coming up with. Here's something you can use to plan for this scenario. But some of it sounds like a science fiction movie uh, in terms of fear. There's something in here about frozen Arctic soils unleashing ancient microorganisms. Has that happened yet? <laughs> so, uh, you know, in the far north um, of, the, of the world, the soils store a lot of carbon and, um, and there's methane underground. And so as that thaws, scientists are, are, expect that you would see some more emissions associated with it. Um, so that as you warm, you couldn't trigger more emissions. Um, and that's what's driving the warming that we're seeing now is greenhouse gas emissions. So things that affect um, those emissions will affect climate. And you're going to continue to make this publicly available? All of our data is publicly available, and we continue to add to it. So we're uh, able to absorb more about the planet and help people better pre prepare for the future. What right. she's talking well, about right there, <laughs> pertaining to microorganisms, is thermofrost. We've known now for quite some time that the thermofrost in the northern lying areas, including Russia, are taking on a different climate because of the warming of the planet from the inside out. It's causing houses to give way, foundations in Alaska. It's causing roads to buckle and to fall in. And it, they're also having these same effects in your northern areas let me put it this way. They're also having that effect in the southern areas of Canada right now that they're going to see more of going up into the northern areas. Once more, as the melting of the ice melts even more, it's going to have a profound effect upon to the planet. And these effects that she's talking about, hopefully can hopefully NASA can can have some sort of an app to where you can go in and actually dissect in what area is being affected more so than the other areas. But it all goes back to biblical Bible prophecy where the Bible talks about that in the last days that as you shall see the days approaching, indicating that you will be able to tangibly see the days approaching, that no flesh shall be saved. Why is this going to occur? Because of what? our oil, petroleum, typhoons have done for the past 30, 40 years, 50 years of, of uh, 
blinding people and blinding themselves and believing that global warming was not real, pertaining to the climate deniers, and now it has caught up with us. The world is going to try to crawfish. They're going to try to reverse these, these uh, elements that are happening around us and underneath us. But to me, it's already too late. Now, I'm not saying that we can't make a difference in at least slowing it down, but the, the, the course that we're on right now, the planet Earth, the, the course that the human consumption of the Earth, the course that we're on is a course of doomsday. Nothing but doom. Because eventually we're going to see, uh, well, right now it'd be, well, let me put it this way, well, right now it'd be a good opportunity to go into the air conditioner business. Because the hotter the planet gets, the more demand it's going to be for people wanting air conditioners. You got people up north in the northern uh, areas in Montana, Minnesota, up towards Canada. They've never had to have an air conditioner because it never got that hot. But now it's going to get hot. And because it's going to get hot, there's going to be more of a demand for those same air conditioners. So that would be a business to get into if you was a business consultant and all you was worried about was uh, making profits off of various objects and, and inventions was to basically enhance your productivity and making more air conditioners. I'm just using that as one example of the different scenarios that are going to happen because of climate change. Somebody just pulled up out here in a black Silverado truck. They're moving on, but they did stop, but they're going on. Sorry about that. Let's get back to our network here. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for breaking it down for us non-scientists. Appreciate it. We'll be right back. I'm Steve. I mean, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a scientist at all. But I do know a little bit about physics. I know that what comes up must come down. I know the gravity, uh, uh, the laws of gravity. I know the laws of God. I know the laws of, of nature. I know the laws of, of other things that happens throughout various countries and various laws that happens. You know, in some countries you get fined $500 for chewing gum. Um, in other countries you can have sex with a, with a young female at the age of 13 and marry her. And in some countries they don't even have a restriction on how young that you can marry people. I know that with America being so diversified, our laws is different in one state versus another state based upon, usually, climate. In other words, there's a reason why that they don't bury people in the ground in Louisiana. is because their casket will basically float up to the top. Just like you don't have to dig in plumbing down to 18 to 23 or 24 inches uh, to be able to put your plumbing supplies down in, in, the, in the southern areas like you do the northern areas that because of various climates. Well, now the climates are going to change. And it may not be necessary to dig the pipes down 18 to 24 inches in the northern areas. But then again, all of a sudden, here will come this this clash of, of a jet stream that will be pushing all that cold air from the northern pole, the Siberian cold front, they call them, that will go all the way down into Texas that will cause people that didn't have their lines dug deep, deep enough or didn't have their lines insulated properly. It will cause catastrophic events. Why is this? Why is this? Because the weather is becoming abnormal irregularities. We're seeing things that now 20 plus years ago we wouldn't have never thought about seeing. 
but now we're seeing them. And to put a blinded eye to that is absolutely insane of that in which what we have been doing now for the past first 50 years of, of these changes that's been going on that now has caught up with us. Like I said, the nations are going to try to crawfish, and I don't blame them at all for trying to reduce it or slow it down. And there's going to be, you know, some some uh, businesses that are going to go out of business on account of this, while others are going to thrive because of this, depending upon who you are, how smart you are, what your investment is in, etc. We're going through abnormalities. And it all goes back to the Jed Clampets. Oil. 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 We are fractioning the ecosystem below our feet every day because I looked it up towards how many barrels of oil gets consumed. And I think the highest rate is here in America because of all the automobiles and, and our Western adjusted living, something like, and I may be wrong about this, but it's something like 200 billion barrels of oil gets used every day. I may be off on that. It may be trillions. I don't know, but it's way, way up there because we're one of the most highest consuming um, oil petroleum company, company users on the planet is right here in the Western world. So we should have been on top of our game even that much more so pertaining to the scientists and the meteorologists and what was going on, but it has caught them flat-footed. To be caught flat-footed means that you have been caught unaware. You have basically been blindsided, but you have created your own blindsidedness because of greed and because of stupidity. And now... It's undeniable that these things are occurring. We can't resist this one. Tune in tonight to cheer on our own Gail King and her family. Yes, that's them. They're appearing on Celebrity Family Feud tonight at 8 o'clock. And of course, tune in on Monday morning to CBS Mornings, where you normally see Gail tomorrow and every day. That's going to be it for us here today. Thank you for watching. Until next week. For Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan. Okay, that's it on that. I'm going to go outside real quick and show my viewers a little bit of work that I've been doing to the Purple Heart Memorial out here. I thank God that the farming agriculture community has gotten some decent rains just within the last couple of days here in northwest Tennessee. Um, whenever I made mention of the Mississippi River starting to go dry, I didn't make a prediction that there was going to be massive droughts. But in regards towards what we just got through discussing, it's going to cause so many irregularities to where some of these areas, like up in the Smoky Mountains in eastern Tennessee and other areas that, that has a lot of forestry, it's going to cause them to become that much more dangerous, sir, that people right now need to try to make preparations for. And I tried to, uh, I tried to emphasize upon this a few years ago whenever they was having such of such of the big brush fires that they was having um, out west. I think it was two years ago, uh, like right around Christmas time, whenever they had like a multi-structural burning event that happened out in Boulder, Colorado, to the degree that one house started catching a fire on top of another house and the elements were just right. To the point that uh, I think it burned over a, over a thousand structures in just a few hours. And the only thing that saved them at the time was um, was to come a blizzard in behind it. That if it wasn't for that, they really don't know how far that the fire would have actually continued to have escalated. 
Well, come to find out that out in Colorado, they don't permit for you to have metal tops. And if those people would have had a metal top on a lot of those buildings, rather than the cinders catching a fire with the initial uh, top that was on the building, maybe the metal top could have prevented that fire from actually consuming their homes or consuming their businesses. I made a proposal in putting in water sprinkling systems on top of these houses. I made a proposal towards graping your house with fire insulated um, tarps to where maybe it would help to save or preserve your home or your business. But I, I never did hear nothing out of that reply pertaining to that. I just wanted to come out here and show you that uh, I have been taking on interest in trying to get this done before this fall. And I don't want people to drive by here and be deceived in what I'm doing. I had three gallon cans of oil-based paint that was blue that I was going to use originally on my property out here. But I decided, because I've done already had it stored for like two years, trying to keep it good, because if you don't watch, paint it go bad and, and whenever it gets cold in the wintertime. I went ahead and used that blue strictly as a sealant. That will not be the original color of, of the wood base. And it was really difficult for me to figure out in what I was going to use on creosote because ordinary paint will not last on creosote like it does on other type of wood. So I had to use a good oil-based paint that would resonate into the wood that would uh, that would uh, seal it like it should because if you look right here, this is just the first coat, you can see some of the brown coming through the blue. Well, the reason for that is because it sucked it up. So it's going to take probably two coats of blue pertaining to sealant. And I did start out with actual sealant um, that's a little bit more aggressive than regular paint. But because it's an oil-based paint and it's going on wood, I really don't think that it's necessary to uh, use a sealant on that type of wood. But now, eventually, what I've come up with, pertaining to the final color, will be will be this color right here. Massey Ferguson red and I feel like that that is a moderate red it's not a bright red okay but after I put it on going through the heat and expansion through the seasons eventually what I'm hoping for is that that red right there will basically blend in with that red on the rock because I'm not going to take the red rock out of the Purple Heart Memorial. I'm going to add purple bluish lights up underneath the red rock and then I'm going to uh, dye the red rock, especially in the Purple Heart area. I'm going to dye it to where whenever you turn, turn the lights on at night, it'll give out a glowing heart effect that I think will will blend in good, like I said, with that that type of red. This is uh, this is exterior oil base enamel paint. And this was the only thing that I could figure out that would be effective on creosote railroad tie crossings that I could depend upon that would be there a year, two years, five years from now. And I'm pretty sure after I get through with it this summer, 
and going through the various coats and doing the various things, I'll still probably next year have to go back and put another coat of that red on there because of the creosote and it being exposed to the outer elements. But I just wanted to explain to my viewers that uh, that we did get decent rains out here that hopefully will satisfy the agriculture communities. And I'm so, so glad that I seen these rains come in whenever they did because I know the greedy farmers, they was gonna have to struggle in their businesses towards making a decision towards irrigating the heck out of their crops just to be able to have a crop versus draining all the Aquador water system below our feet. And I'm so glad that the agriculture community is not gonna to have to make that decision this year in this particular area. Now they may have to make that decision in another area uh, pertaining to the Aquador systems like out in Colorado or out in California or out towards uh, uh, New Mexico or, or Phoenix, Arizona or somewhere. I mean, they're still having torrential hot uh, environments out there. But hopefully this year, um, the, uh, the agriculture communities will not have to make that decision. Now, I don't know what it's going to do two weeks from now. I don't think nobody has that type of a crystal ball toward being able to read into the, the tea leaves, per se, and understanding just exactly what's going to happen. But the early stuff that the farmers has put in in this particular area has been pretty well taken care of between not only the rains that has caused the material to come up, but now the rains that is going to cause it to continue to pollinate. And hopefully they'll have decent good years this year in that aspect. Now, does that mean because it rains in the lower 48 that the Mississippi River is still going to be all right? No, it does not. Keep in mind, we're on the lower end of the Mississippi, not the upper end. So what goes on up on the upper end above Illinois, Minnesota, and all the surrounding states is going to have a big effect upon to the Mississippi River of whether or not it gets adequate rain, moderate rain, or no rain. And if you'll put that in conjunction with the world warming up pertaining to the evaporation, one thing can lead to another to the degree that it could cause a nightmarish situation the same as it did last year whenever the barges did not have enough water to go up and down the Mississippi without having to run about halfway empty. Hopefully, we won't have to see that again this year, but it's a good possibility that it could happen, especially whenever you're seeing these type of patterns happening on the other six continents all over the world. Something is going on. And it's not just going on pertaining to the ozone and all the carbon dioxide gases that we're putting up into the world. That's only part of it. The other part is what we're doing below our feet. I hope that this message will be a message of enlightenment that will help to open the eyes up of a lot of people pertaining to not only the Windmill Ministries missions, that were, that were here at 291 Thompson Road um, seeing, seeing the, uh, the whereabouts of. But hopefully, um, hopefully this will help people all over the world in initiating our testimonies throughout the world. Somebody out here on a four-wheeler about a month ago, I found this out in the road. I don't know whose it was. I thought I'd put it up here. I'm sure it was some local around here that had a four-wheeler. Anyways, they lost their knives, lost one of their knives out here. They get out here and they uh, snoop around and uh, want to look around and be nosy, which that's fine. I don't have no problem in them looking. I just don't want them coming on to the property uh, with it being unattended like it is right now. And if they do, I have security cameras up uh, to the degree of being able to capture whatever happens out here. It's really sad whenever you come back home into an area that you thought that you could trust and my brother and I get attacked the way that we was attacked in 2014 
that led up to his death in 2017. It's really sad that I had to be out this much of expenses just to be able to uh, protect our investment out here that my brother and I had already made a decision towards being able to help the, uh, the community, not just the military community, but the community in large uh, towards expressing our gratitude and hopefully we can help people with our testimony and them not making the same bad decisions as we did in the past. But it's really sad whenever you come back to your home area and you have to be on the defensive in this, in this way because of the very people that you put more trust in than you did anybody else. Military ministries. What inspired me about that was First Baptist Church out in Clarksville, Tennessee, pretty close to uh, the military base out there, has a very, very strong military mission involving those that have been exposed to bad events. And you have to admit that if it's associated with the military, there's going to be bad events. Well, they really inspired me because of seeing the stuff that I was seeing and how that they took care of, of the military personnel in the Fort Campbell area. And I was really, really inspired by how that they initiated so much, so much uh, interest in wanting to help our United States military people in engaging in the needs of military personnel. And that's what basically inspired me towards my brother and I getting intimately connected with the VFW club and military affairs and hopefully one day being able to help not hurt, but help the world in general towards the affairs that's going on right now all over the world. I want to say thank you. God bless you. God bless America. God bless America and our endeavors towards where we go in the future. Good luck to each and every one of us. And God bless our United States military. Thanks for listening here at 291 Thompson Road. Here at the very place that was vandalized that my brother and I was having a fight for pertaining to a special tribute to our veterans, our American veterans worldwide all over the planet the broken cross. God bless. Shalom.